Next on the list here, we have this pretty sick thread uh, that I kind of stumbled across on on Twitter actually, courtesy of a Twitter account called Mitch underscore Kanaka, and it's essentially an entire thread of the history of Supreme. And I really recommend you check it out if you're not that clued up about Supreme and stuff and want to find out more about the brand and you don't want to read many interviews or go through tons of articles. I really recommend checking out this thread and skimming across it and kind of getting some of the main parts of it. And I'm quickly going to read a couple of bits of it here. It says Supreme is now valued at $2.1 billion um, dollars and their products resell at 1,200% profit right price. But it only costs 12 k to open its first store. This is a crazy story of how Supreme created this cult-like brand. And you've got a picture here of James Jebbia standing out of the original Supreme store and another Supreme store here. I think that's a fake one in China somewhere. It continues. It says Supreme is focused on two things, limited edition drops, exclusivity, and strong community. Yeah, right. But many businesses got good communities and limited offers so what's the deal here let's get started he said okay it started with a boy named james jebbia he was 15 when he was in the played in a british series called grain chill which is obviously something that a lot of people if you're down you would know called tommy watson in 1978 20 years later he was going to hit 800 million net worth he's worth 800 million oh fucking hell James moved to NYC in the 1980s. Um, he found a job in Manhattan-based clothing store, Parachute. The job was nice, but he wanted something of his own, so he opened up Union NYC on 172 Spring Street in 1989. If I'm not mistaken, Union he opened up with his wife, I'm sure, at the time. Or am I not mistaken with his partner? And then when he decided to take Supreme full-time, I think Chris Gibbs was working there already, and that's when he took over the reins. I'm pretty sure that's how it worked out. And then there's another story about Undefeated, isn't it, right? Like, I think Undefeated was a name that, um, that um, what's his name, Aaron Bondaroff made up and then he swapped Undefeated for a New York thing that the guy called James Bond, I think, who founded the Undefeated kind of had. So it's, there's some weird law around New York brands. I wish I remembered all of it, but there's some weird law around that whole retail mafia group, whatever. But it's very, very deep and very long lasting. A lot of connections there. And a lot of people that sprung up from the union have done crazy different things in the industry as well. So it's really far reaching the influence of Supreme Union and all that stuff. It continues. It says Union was his first step in into what's known as streetwear. In 1991, James helped uh, established um, Stussy NYC soon Stussy was a surfer and he's called the father of streetwear who started out by painting surfboards so the connection there is deep again another storied and legendary brand that's still going strong this day even though Sean Stussy is not involved in it at all it says um, while still working at Stussy James Jebby launched Supreme Meant, oh, so he was working as Super Stussy at the time. Okay, I thought it was Union. Okay, fair enough. Many say that Supreme wouldn't have emerged if it had not been for Sean Stussy around it. The first Supreme store was open on Lafayette Street. The year was 1994, and the place looked like this. It's mad to actually go there. When you, I remember when I first went there, and like, what did I go there? The first and only time I went there was when I first went to New York City. Was when was it? Was it 2008 or something like that, or 2010? Long time ago, right? And one of the main things that you get from it when you go in there, especially being a hardcore Supreme fan and a hardcore Supreme Shooter fan, it does kind of feel like you're going on a bit of a pilgrimage. It feels kind of eerie because you've watched and kind of observed and loved the store from afar for so, so long. So long, right? Um, to the point where you're fantasizing about going there for ages, right? You'll see it in magazines, you see it in flipping um, magazine scans online, you see it in random videos and whatnot. You'd get second hand accounts from people on forums. And then when you finally go there, it's like, whoa. And the first thing I remember being struck with when I went there was how loud the music was. I don't know if it's the same nowadays, but that Lafayette store, the music was absolutely blaring from that store like literally like nightclub music like nightclub level of loudness i was like whoa because you know it's used to that of course and it wasn't like you know i'm used to working in retail stores where essentially they ban you from playing anything decent that you listen to yourself and your own ipod or whatnot so you end up just having to play vanilla basic ass radio hits and whatnot but they were playing like you know really aggressive hip-hop really amazing metal like super super loud that's one thing i remember just getting caught off guard with and of course the sales assistants were fucking rude as hell they kind of did, they definitely did live up to the archetype of their store assistants just being dickheads and kind of vibing you out and making you essentially beg and plead them for the ability to 
you know, for for the privilege of them going to the back and getting you a t shirt and whatnot. It was absolutely nuts. But I loved it all. Do you know I mean I love being talking I love being treated like shit in there because I came back again. I think the time we went there it was on sale too. So we were able to grab some bargains and I was back in the day when the dollar was, you know, really cheap compared to the pound. So you could get a lot more stuff for the for your for your money. Nowadays you're essentially paying the same price you would in dollars and pounds anyway, so it's no real difference. Um the conversion rate's a bit shit. But yeah, that's the first thing I remember going up to straight away like and it was obviously far bigger than what it looked like on the magazine too that's what i remember too it was a lot bigger it continues it says the store you can see the picture above got closed in 2019 tw 25 years after the brand launching yeah so it's not there anymore so that's mad but that was the heart of what you would, could say about streetwear it was just not a clothing store it was also a hub for the regional streetwear community for sure that's what i remember as well you could definitely you definitely knew you were coming around supreme because the first thing you could hear was wheels slapping on the floor like people skateboarding straight away you could hear wheels slapping da, da, ra, ra, ra. the sound of skateboards you know rolling across the floor in concrete and the pavements and stuff so it was pretty sick and the first supreme store um stormed the neighborhood skaters came not only to buy something but also meet with another it was important because there was only one such place at the time called keith herring's pop shop between lafayette and corsby but pop shop was different it was a kind of range merged between um, art pieces and a spot for hippies and it didn't have the underground atmosphere so jebia had his niche he gave his target more much more than new clothing he contributed to the underground culture his growth was just obvious um what's more james was a clever entrepreneur he had he had a great growth strategy supreme underproduced in other words shortage in clothing equals growth in the growing demand seth Godin analyzed the case of supreme's marketing in a nutshell he said it was as follows the scarcity effect the premium look and the skillful guessing of people's desires although supreme could sell more they produce less it made their products scarce and unique and they also target a bit richer custom, customer sorry they knew that their customer wanted to raise their social status looking good and um premium me, I'm sure he does a job and that's the thing that I remember back in the day now it's not so much because I think it's more lame and probably a little bit cringe and a little bit you know um people just used to seeing the logo too much but i remember back in the day when it was actually hard to find people wearing supreme and it was legitimately like if you saw if you saw someone wearing supreme it was equivalent to me going to a foreign country somewhere in the middle of central europe and seeing another black guy and be like whoa and you know you give each other that little nod of like yeah respect so the same with supreme you'd be like wow you saw another kid wearing supreme top especially if it was something that was like from yesteryear or just came out recently like how did they get hold of it because you can't buy it online you can't buy it here you have to get shipped over generally it was a bit of a hard thing to kind of get so when you saw someone with it it definitely did increase your when you felt sorry when you wore it yourself it definitely did cre increase your social status you definitely felt way cooler nowadays i don't think kids actually legitimately care it doesn't actually do anything if anything it probably makes you look more lame but back then a box logo a supreme piece anyway in general doesn't matter if it's got a box logo on it or not if someone could guess it was supreme they'll definitely consider you to be a cooler person just because of the clothes you wore but I'd also say back then, also to be fair to us, we were also far more interesting as well because, you know, we didn't have the access that people have nowadays. So if you were buying that kind of stuff, you, you kind of wanted to walk the walk. So you'd listen to the, you know, quote unquote, right music. You'd write, watch the right films. You'd read the right books. You'd try to expose yourself to as much as that kind of overall world as possible so that you were kind of all encompassing cool and not just like cool with the t shirt and the hat. You I mean, you didn't want to be service level cool. Where now these kids, I feel like, are way more okay with just being like service level cool, like just having a look, wearing the pearl earrings, painting the nails, um, having the kind of punk aesthetic, but not having any punk music in their flipping, you know, iTunes or Serato or spotify not really watching anything kind of counterculture or edgy just watching all normie basic bitch sort of stuff and not really kind of ingratiating themselves in the look that they're kind of ascribing to that's the only thing i'd say there's a bit of a malaise with this generation i don't know what it is really because you know with the access you would imagine you'd want to soak yourself in a little bit more but they seem hesitant to do it they just want to put on a uniform feel cool make TikTok videos and keep it moving which is you know disappointing but it is what it is i guess everyone's got their faults so it continues says here but that's not all as part of the sex guest strategy they introduced drops the drops appeared on thursdays and saturdays in japan to avoid queues a number of people were invited to join the drops so yeah back in the day that you'd queue outside and sleep outside this has obviously changed completely now there was a rule though one uh, one item only per cut uh, only one item per customer um so some people went with their friends to get styles that's back in the day when people used to bring their mums and that to the queues i can't there was 
in my whole time queuing, I never once saw a black mum in the queue queuing for some kid to buy flipping trainers or clothes. Never in the history of me queuing, never did I ever see a black mum, which made a lot of sense. Imagine trying to ask a black mum to take to go with you to flipping central London to stand outside of a shop for five plus hours to have the opportunity and a chance to buy a pair of sneakers or clothing that you might be able to resell later on a chance not a, not a guarantee or certainty a chance and sometimes in some stores i remember i won't name them some stores wouldn't even sell to your mum because they'll be like no nah, she's not gonna wear it we know you're just bringing her to get an extra one for yourself so they wouldn't sell to them some stores would be that petty they wouldn't even sell to your mum if she queued up for six hours they'd be like nah she's not gonna wear it you're just bringing her here to get an extra one for yourself so like can you imagine your mum your african mum putting up that or a black mum in general it's not gonna happen so um, that was always funny to see these kind of essentially privileged white kids who had mums who were around and not working who were able to come to drops at 9 a.m in the morning and just hang around and stuff and you know try to get an extra jumper or hoodie for their kid and shit it continues to say there's also some mystery about the web next supreme drop is going to take place only a few people are informed about it of course today you can get news faster exactly back in the day we didn't have any of this stuff we didn't have the excellent account that i follow on twitter supreme drops it didn't exist you'd have to guess what was in there people would have to go to the store and report back to forums and say what they saw you couldn't take pictures inside the store it was really hard to get the shit nowadays people have pdfs they have flipping um line sheets of the stuff that are going to be in there they know exactly what items are going to be there they can they know the prices is, it's eerie it's scary how different it is nowadays but anyway i'm not gonna read the entire thing check it out yourself i'll put the link in the in the clip note in the clip actually description i'll put the link in there also in the podcast link in the podcast um description i also put the link so you can check it out yourself but it's really really interesting recommend you check it out uh if read by mitch or m-i-c-h underscore kanaka k-a-n-k-a i'm um, talking about supreme history of it so definitely check it out if you haven't definitely check it out if you haven't